Sword in the Stone, Chapter 21 The day for the great ceremony drew near, the invitations to King Pellinor and Sir Grumor were sent out, and the wart withdrew himself more and more into the kitchen. "'Come on, wart, old boy!' said Sir Ector ruefully. "'I didn't think you would take it so bad. It doesn't become you to do this, sulking.' "'I am not sulking,' said the wart. "'I don't mind a bit, and I am very glad that Kay is going to be a knight. Please don't think I am sulking.' "'You are a good boy,' said Sir, Sir Ector. "'I know you're not sulking, really, but do cheer up. Kay isn't such a bad stick, you know, in his way.' "'Kay is a splendid chap,' said the wart. "'Only I was not happy because he did not seem to want to go hawking or anything with me any more.' "'It's his usefulness,' said Sir Ector. "'It will all clear up.' "'I am sure it will,' said the ward. "'It is only that he doesn't want me to go with him just at the moment, "'and so, of course, I don't go.' "'But I will go,' added the ward, "'as soon as he commands me. "'I will do exactly what he says. "'Honestly, I think Kay is a good person, "'and I was not sulking a bit. "'You have to have a glass of this canary,' said Sir Ector. And go see if old Merlin can start cheering you up. Sir Ector has given me a glass of canary, said the wart, and sent me to see if you can cheer me up. Sir Ector, said Merlin, is a wise man. Well, said the wart, what about it? The best thing for disturbances of the spirit, replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow, is to learn. That is the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies, and you may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love and lose your monies to a monster. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics, or know your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it, then, to learn. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. That is the only thing which the poor mind can never exhaust. Never alienate, never be tormented, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. Learning is the thing for you. Look at what a lot of things there are to learn. Pure science, the only purity there is. You can learn astronomy in a lifetime, natural history in three lifetimes, literature in six, and then, after you have exhausted a million lifetimes in biology and medicine and theocriticism and geography and history and economics, why, you can start to make a cartwheel out of the, the appropriate wood, or spend fifty years learning to begin to learn to beat your adversary at fencing. After that, you can start again in mathematics until it is time to learn to plough. Apart from all these things, said the wart, what do you suggest for me to do just now? Let me see, said the magician, considering. We have... "'had a short six years of this, and in that time I think I am right in saying "'that you have been something of either animal, vegetable, or mineral, "'something in earth, air, fire, or water.' "'I don't know much,' said the wart, "'about the animals and earth. "'Then the best thing is that you should meet my friend, the badger.' "'I have never met a badger.' "'Good,' said Merlin. "'Except for dear old Archimedes, I think he is the most learned creature that I know. "'You will like him, by the way. "'By the way, Wart,' said the magician, stopping in the middle of, the, of his spell, "'there is one thing I ought to tell you. "'This is the last time I shall turn you into anything. "'All the magic of that kind of thing has been you for that kind of thing has been used up, "'and this will be the end of your education. "'When Kay has been knighted, my labours will be over. "'You will have to go away then, and be a squire in the wide world, "'and I shall go elsewhere. "'Do you think you have learned anything?' "'I have learned and been happy.' "'That's all right, then,' said Merlin. "'Try to remember what you learned.' He proceeded with the spell and pointed his wand of lignum vitae at the little bear, which had just now, be which had just begun to glow in the, in the dimity as it hung by its tail from the North Star, and called out cheerfully, "'Have a good time for the last night! Give love to Badger!' The call sounded from far away, and Wart found himself standing at the, at the edge of a fallen bank in the forest sauvage, with a big black hole in front of him. Badger lives in there, he said to himself, and I am supposed to go and talk to him, but I won't. It was bad enough never to be a knight, but now my own tutor that I found on the only quest I shall ever have is to be taken away from me also, when there will be no more natural history or exciting duels with Madame Mim. Very well. I will have, to, I will have one more night of joy before I am condemned. And as I am a wild beast now, I will be a wild beast, and there it is. 
so he trundled off fiercely over the twilight snow, for it was winter. If you are feeling desperate, a badger is a good thing to be. A relation to the bears, otters and whistles. You are the nearest thing to a bear now left in England, and your skin is so thick that it makes no difference who bites you. As far as your own bite is concerned, there is something about the formation of your jaw which makes it impossible to be dislocated. And so however much the thing you are biting twists about, there is no reason you should ever let go. You are one of the few creatures who can munch up hedgehogs quite unconcernedly. Un un who can munch up head hedgehogs quite unconcernedly, just as you can munch up everything else from wasps' nests to roots to baby rabbits. So it happened that a sleeping hedgehog was the first thing which came in the wart's way. Hedge pig, said the wart, peering at his victim with blurred, short-sighted eyes. I am going to munch you up. The hedgehog, which was hidden which had hidden its own bright little eye buttons and long, sensitive nose inside its curl, and which had ornamented its spikes with a not very tasteful arrangement of dead leaves before going to bed for the winter in its grassy nest, woke up and squealed most lamentably. The more you squeal, said the wart, the more I shall gnash. It makes my blood boil within me. Oh, Beast of Brock, cried the hedgehog, holding himself tight shut. Good Beast of Brock, show mercy to a poor urchin, and don't ye be tyrannical. Us be it no common tiggy, Meester, for us be munched and, for us to be munched and mumbled. Have mercy, kind sir, a harmless flea-bitten crofter, which can't tell his left hand nor his right. Hedge pig, said the wart remorselessly, forbear to whine neither thrice nor once. Alas, my poor wife and children! I bet you haven't got any. Come out of that, thou tramp, and prepare to meet thy doom. Mr. Brock, implored the unfortunate pig. Come now, and don't be awkward, me sweet Mr. Brock, my duck. Hearken to an urchin's prayer. Grant the dear boon of life to this most uncommon tiggy lordly meester, and he shall sing to thee in numbers sweet, or teach ye how to suck a cow's milk in the pearly dew. Sing? asked the wart, stopping, quite taken aback. Aye, sing? cried the hedgehog, and it began hurriedly to sing, in a very placating manner, but rather muffled, because it dared not uncurl. Oh, Jenny V! It sang most mournfully into its tummy. Sweet Genevieve, the days may come, the days may go, the light of memory weaves, those gentle dreams of long ago. It also sang about, without pausing, for a moment between the songs, Home Sweet Home and the Old Rustic Bridge by the Mill. Then, because it had finished all its repertoire, it drew it drew a hurried but quavering breath, and began again on Genevieve. After that it sang Home Sweet Home and the Old Rustic Bridge by the Mill. Come on, said the wart, you can stop that, I won't bite you. Clementius, Meister, whispered the hedge pig humbly, I shall bless the saints and board of governors for the good and most kindly chops, so long as fleas skip nor urchins climb up chimbleys. Then, for fear that its brief repast of prose might have hardened the tyrant's heart, it launched out breathlessly into Genevieve for the third time. Stop singing, said the wart. <clears throat> for heaven's sake, uncurl. I won't do you any harm. Come, you silly little urchin, and tell me where you learned those beautiful songs. Uncurl is one word, answered the porcupine tremblingly. It did not feel in the least fretful at the moment. But curling up is still another. If he was to see my little naked nose, meester, at this dispicious moment, he might feel a twitching in thy white toothsomes, and all's fear and love and thwar. And we do know, let on singy again, sweet master Brock, concerning thick there rustic mill. I don't want to hear it any more. You sing it very well. But I don't want it again. Uncurl, you idiot, and tell me where you learned to sing. Thus be it, no common urchin, quavered the, fur cre quavered the poor creature, staying curled up as tight as ever. I swore a talk, when a little by one of them there gentry-like, as it might be from the mother's breast, 
I don't e nip our tender vittles, lovely Meester Brock, for e were a proper gentleman. E were and brought us up full company on cow's milk, and that all supped out from a lonely dish. And there beant many urchins what a drunken tap water out of porcelain than that there beant. I don't know what you were talking about, said the wart. E were a gentleman, cried the hedgehog desperately. Tell e, like I tell e, e took on. When us war little, and fed on when us had no more, he were a proper gentleman. What fed on tea parlour, like what no urchin had been afore nor since, fed out from gentlemen's porcelain eye, and a dreary day at war. Whatever us left us for naught but willingness, that thou mayest be sure. What was the name of this gentleman? He wore a gentleman, he wore. He had no proper name, not like you may remember, but he wore a gentleman that he wore and fed us out of a porcelain. Was he called Merlin? asked the wart curiously. Ah, that were his name, a proper fine name it were, but us never could lay tongue to it by nary means. Ah, mean her called itself and fed us out of a porcelain like a proper fine gentleman. Oh, do uncurl, exclaimed the wart. I know the man who kept you, and I think I have seen you yourself when you were a baby in cotton wool. Come on, urchin, I'm sorry I frightened you. We are friends here, and I want to see your little grey wet twitching nose, just for old sake's sake. Twitching nose be one name, answered the hedgehog obstinately, and a twitching of the nose be another Meester, now you move along, kind Meester Brock, and leave a poor creature to teak its winter drowse. Let me think of be let you think of beetles or honey, sweet baron, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Nonsense, exclaimed the wart. I won't do you any harm, because I knew you when you were little. Ah, oh, them badgers, said the poor thing to its tummy. They go a-borrowing with them. They go burrowing about with no harm in their hearts, Lord bless them. But don't they fair give you a nip without a notice of it, Lord bless ye, what is a retired mun to do? It's that their skin of theirs, that's what it be, which from their earliest children they've been a nipping of among each other, and also of their mars without a feeling of anything among themselves. So naturally they nips elsewhere like the seam. Now, my poor gentleman, Meester Man, they were all as a Russian alter his ankles, with their yik, 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 when they wanted to be fed like those what he kept from littles. And holy church, how he would scream, Ay, tis a mollicky thing to deal with they badgers, that us may be sore. Don't see nothing, added the hedgehog before work could protest. Blunder along, like to one of they ambling hearth rugs on the outsides of their girt feet, get in their way for a moment, just out of fortune like, without nary wicked intentions, and tis snip snip, just like that, out of self defence for the hungry blind. And then when are you? Only police us can do for him, continued the urchin, is to hit it on a nose. A killy heel, they neem it, on to scriptures. Hit one of they girt trollops on to nose, bim bam, like that, eh? And the sharp life is fair out of him. Ere he can snuffle, tis a fair knockout that it is. But how can a poor urchin dump on her to nose? concluded the lecturer mournfully. When he ha'n't got nothing to dump with, nor no way to hold un. And then they comes about and they asks him for he to uncurl. And we will pause there.